You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. Next week, I'm going to get Ed back down to the nine-foot homemade oak bar in my basement. We'll get back to normal. But I I do appreciate you being so flexible uh, this time around, doing things mobile from where you're at and I'm where I'm at. I'd like to preserve my lung function and sinuses. Thank you. Well, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, James Fox filled in because I've been struggling with something. I've got three kids in the house and me, and there's been something going around the last, like, two weeks, and Dad's getting his butt kicked. Just down for the count. I got put on antibiotics now today, finally. You know, because they make you get really, really sick before they give you those. Like, I knew I needed them four days ago. Yeah. You got to get really, really sick until the doctor goes, all right, fine, I'll give them to you. If you're in Europe, (laughs) you can just go to the corner store and pick up antibiotics, right? Like, if I were in Italy, I would have been like, yep, seems like an upper respiratory infection. I'm just going to go up the street and pick up some antibiotics and a big loaf of bread. Like, that's what I would have done. Well, in Italy, don't they just hand you a giant crusty loaf of bread with everything anyway? Right? Yeah. Well, I mean, deal? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, really exciting stuff going on. I'm glad that you had James Fox on to talk about the 40-man uh, roster for the White Sox because then we see all these additions. Aaron Bummer gets dealt. One guy goes away, and Chris Getz brings back one-eighth of his 40-man roster, essentially. He goes right. one for five in a, in a deal and I want to break down this deal because I, I I find it fascinating. I find the comments the day after by Getz fascinating. I think it's really setting up for something I was hoping was going to happen this offseason. I think the naysayers are always going to naysay. But I continue to take a positive look at this team in this episode of Socks in the Basement. And every episode of Socks in the Basement brought to you by Cork and Carey at the park. The official home of the podcast for fans by fans. Socks in the basement, uh, 33rd in Princeton, in the shadow of the ballpark, two for one on Tuesdays, go see Gino uh, at the bar, two for one, Burgers, the award-winning Burgers, uh, they are your home base for White Sox pregame, postgame, and viewing parties, and here during the offseason, stop in there for the weekly specials all through this weekend, still the $4 Half Acre Daisy Cutter cans, the $2 Bud Light cans, the $12 Comfort Food platters, the meatloaf, the fried chicken dinners, uh, the featured bourbon, whiskey soldier so get on over there and don't forget about the location at 106th and western the traditional irish bar that started it all in the beverly neighborhood cork and carry see more at cork and but aaron bummer goes away and my father is so happy <laughs> hey, who, yeah i imagine he is <laughs> old men hated aaron bummer like i didn't like aaron bummer Young that men much. hated aaron bummer i th- there was a lot of people who didn't want to see look it, it, nothing against Aaron Bummer's stuff, right? That, that was the thing. His his stuff is ridiculously comical to look at because he, he just he does cartoon things with the ball. The problem with Aaron Bummer is always going to be he either is going to be effectively wild and strike guys out, or he is going to have to be a guy who pitches to contact, which means your defense has to be really, really good behind him because the ball's going to do weird things off the bat for him. You're going to have weird soft liners. You're going to have pop-ups. You're going to have ground balls that move on you. So he's he's just not what the White Sox always sold him as, which is a guy that's going to come in and just lock down a team no matter what. He's a guy. He's He couldn't do that because his biggest problem is. My, my quick scouting report on Aaron Bummer the last couple of years is a pitcher that if you just want to go up there and stand like a statue, more often than not, he's going to throw four balls before he throws three strikes. Right. Like, if you don't chase, it's hard for him to strike you out the way that he approaches things. He do- he doesn't know where the ball is going. He, no! He's like, he's like a knuckleballer with spin because he just doesn't know where, it, where it's going the way, the way that you would listen to, say, Charlie Huff back in the day talk about not knowing where the knuckleball is headed. Bummer doesn't know where he's throwing it. He just knows that how to put the spin on it. He knows how to do it. And the Braves, for their part, they look at it and they go, we're building up the left side of our bullpen because that division has guys like Bryce Harper in it that they need to compete with, right? They need to be able to get that guy out. They need to be able to to to, to hit all these left-handed batters, these wonderful left-handed batters that are in the, the NL East. And so they're, they're looking at this like, this guy could be a huge part for us. What he's not going to be for the Braves is what – we were sold on Bummer as being like a potential closer. He's not going to do that. No. Which makes this deal 
all the more impressive for Chris Getz to do what he did to identify two guys that were getting non-tendered by the Braves that are completely useful to the White Sox, and then three other guys that can definitely definitely have a shot to help them. What I like is his comments the day after because that's a, he he described this deal as exactly what it was, and it's something that they needed to go and do. What have we been talking about? There's no depth on this team. You have too None. many holes, and you it's not like too you've many got holes a, to fill. You've got too. It's not like you have a ton of money to go and fix it, and you want to change your team. What he's doing, what Getz is doing, is what I would do. I, I I hate saying this too because again, I will say it over and over again. He was not my choice. But if this is the guy we're going to have, I'm trying to look at the positives in the building for seven years, but not actually able to make these decisions. Knows an awful lot about what he's got in terms of his minor league system because he was in charge of it. Understands that he doesn't have a lot of depth, understands who the owner is, understands how crazy the inside of that building is. I'm looking at the White Sox story about how Jason Benetti was insulted by Brooks Boyer. And that might be one of the reasons why he left that the Sun-Times right, put out. Yeah. I mean, there's always oddities and weirdities in there, and he's already used to it. But what he does is he, understanding all of that, says, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to clean out some garbage. The stuff I can control, I will control. So I'm going to move on from a bunch of people that were Kenny's boys and Rick's boys. I'm going to start bringing in boys that are mine, people I trust. I'm going to bring in some people that are highly recommended, that have had success in other places. And I'm going to start establishing this is what we want White Sox baseball to be. I'm with this manager over here that's got two years on his deal that I'm not opposed to having around, but unless he does something great this year or I start to feel good about him, I can always replace him at the end of 2024. That's not a big deal. And so let's let's focus on what we can focus on. And what's the easiest thing to fix when you go out and start adding players? You can you can fix the pitching depth and you can get defense because defense is cheaper than home runs. Right. And pitching and defense wins championships in the end. Like you need pitching and defense for when the bats aren't working. I'm not saying you could be a 220 hitting team and win a World Series, but they are very important things and they are the cheapest things, defense, defense especially. Defense is so cheap to go get and add to your team. And if he thought to himself, I need a base, this is the kind of move that gives him a base. And that's exactly what he described it as. This was a move where he moved on from a relief pitcher and established a base. Two middle infielders, very good defensively, one of which will be starting in the middle infield, I would imagine, unless something comes along that's better. But Nicky Lopez is Elvis Andrus, but younger and may still have a really good year in front of him. We saw him hit 277 once he got to the to the Braves last year, and we saw him have a, a season where he hit 300 just a few years ago, and he's still in his 20s. And, and then he goes out and he gets three guys that are either starting pitchers or potentially a starting pitcher in the major leagues, all for a relief pitcher. And in my mind, relief pitchers are just... A relief pitcher with an ERA over six. Right, a relief pitcher is just a guy who couldn't be a starting pitcher. That's why he's a specialist. That, that's what they are. And so in the end, what did Aaron Bummer bring you? But Mike Soroka, his ceiling is an ace. I don't know if he'll be there. Don't. I'm not saying that's what he is, but the guy was an ace. He was second in NL Cy Young voting. He gets injured... And he's out for two years, essentially. He has an Achilles injury that knocks him out. Actually, two and a half years, he gets knocked out of Major League Baseball. He comes back for a very short time and hurts himself in rehab. He only gets a few starts last year. And he becomes available because he's not in their long-term plans and there's only one year of control left. But this is the kind of guy we were talking about with like, hey, we should look at Jack Flaherty or Luis Severino because these guys are going to come free and they've had success before an injury may be the only reason why they're not doing very well, but that rebound is coming, much like we saw with Johnny Cueto a couple years ago, even though he's older. We're talking of a guy who, who's 26 years old, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. And and even though there's one year of control, sign this guy for three years right now on the cheap if you can get it, because he's going to be part of your rotation, whether he hits his ceiling or if he just comes back to an acceptable starting pitcher level, he's part of your rotation when you have none. I love just him straight up for bummer. I would have enjoyed. I would have accepted an order of uh, a burger and fries from five guys, let alone five actual guys that they could use as Major League Baseball players for Aaron Bummer. But Meanwhile, if you're looking for exterior windows, doors, patio doors, storm doors, look no further than Window and Door Superstore of Oak Forest. No high-pressure sales. Go on in and visit them. See everything 
full-sized right there in front of you, the owner in the showroom. There's an owner on site when they complete the job. They use their own installers. They're not farming out the work. If you're going to do something that big, replacing the windows in your home, you want to make sure you're doing it right. You want to see the examples full size beforehand. You want to know that from the moment you start the process to the end, you're dealing with just one company. That's Window and Door Superstore of Oak Forest. 40 years in business, in Oak Forest since 1985. All major brands custom made. No stock items for a perfect fit. They are a half block east of 159th in Ridgeland. Make them your first and only stop at 6280 159th Street. See more at windowdooroakforest.com. The other thing, too, you know, and here's the thing. You, you said something about the naysayers are always going to naysay. And honestly, if you look at a trade like this, I don't care what you think about Chris Getz. I don't care what you think about the hire. You would have rather have had more of a procedure or a search go on. This is a shrewd move by this White Sox general manager. And if you're upset with this move, go be a Cubs fan. Okay? just I'm <laughs> done with you as part of the fan base. Just because this is, this is intelligence on Chris Getz's part. Soroka and Lopez were going to be DFA'd because from a cost standpoint, they felt like Vaughn Grissom, who is one of their top prospects, was going to be better served as the guy that they work into the middle of the, the field and, and to back up Austin Riley and move him around and get him at bats. Not Le not Nicky Lopez. Lopez was a, a patch job last year when they had injuries. Soroka, they have a contending rotation already, and they've got guys that are in the wings waiting, and they probably want to go with another veteran starter the Braves don't have time to figure out if Mike Soroka can rebound. And right, and now here's the thing. They're not going to waste on a guy when they have so much pitching. A contract now. So what happens if he pitches well? He just goes in the free agency. They're not in the same position as the White Sox. They have depth and they have stars and they're at a different level. But for what the White Sox are doing right now, he makes an awful lot of sense. And look at what he did last year. Coming off of the injury, coming off of a, a two-and-a-half-year break, okay? He didn't finish the season. He did have some arm soreness at the end of the year. It was just inflammation. It's just kind of normal pitcher stuff, right? The dude's arm kind of wore out because he hadn't used it in a couple of years. His velocity was up from, from prior years. But in the minors, down on the farm before he got into the rotation or around when he was in the Braves rotation, he had a whip of 1.069. That is up there with what he was doing in the minors before he came up and before he had his major league debut where he was a Cy Young candidate. He had a greater strikeouts per nine than he did in his best season with the Braves in their starting rotation. It carried over even into the major leagues where his 8.1 Ks per nine was still pretty good. He kept his walks low. He was getting hit a little bit. And that was, you know, and really... You're talking about a guy who hasn't been there, who's now also, for Soroka, think about this too, last year mentally, they're in a pennant race. He's got to try and regain. He was the ace of the staff a couple of years ago. He's trying to regain that. You you can't tell me that Mike Soroka comes in here, and especially if Chris Getz can give him some guaranteed money right off the bat, give him a couple of years and say, look, rehab, figure it out. We're going to contend eventually. We want you to be a part of this thing. Stick around, buddy. Let's find out what you got. He does not have to have any pressure on him. He can just relearn how to pitch and bring himself back. And he is, like you said, he was an ace-level guy before the Achilles injury. He could get back to 80% of that. He's at least a number two or three. He was 21 at that point. That's that's the thing I want people to compare to. I want to compare Mike Soroka's best season to Dylan Cease's best season. Because at 21 years old in 2019, before he gets himself hurt very early in the shortened 2020 season, and then he misses all of 21 he misses essentially all of 22 because he tries to come back and he hurts himself almost right away in the minor leagues while he's rehabbing. And then in 23, he gets 17 games down in the minor leagues and he's up for about six or it looks like what? No, seven games in the majors, right? Because he's still coming out of his injury. You can't expect a guy after all that time off. Like he's just going to come walking in and be the same guy. But he's going to next year be 26 years old. Meanwhile, Dylan Cease is going to be 28 years old next year. All right. His best season, Cease, 184 innings pitched. Soroka, 174 innings pitched in his big season that he had. Dylan Cease had a FIP of 3.10. Soroka was a 3.45. Dylan Cease is a 1.109 whip. And Mike Soroka is a 1.11 whip. They're very, very similar. And meanwhile, Soroka is younger. And he's going to be cheaper if you go and knock on his door right now while he's still trying to figure out what he is. And I'm telling you, I, if I were the White Sox... Be bold. See if you can get this guy for a song. 
See if you can say, hey, you know what? Before we get to the point where you're getting to arbitration, let's give you this, but let's make it multi-year. Let's lock you in. Because this is exactly what I was talking about. Like, go out and get the guys that are coming off an of injury that have all this ki- all this potential. Because you need to have a few guys like that. Because th- those guys hit. If you can evaluate that medically he's back to normal, and your guys look at his stuff, and you say, whew, I think we got something here. Then, then get it now before he goes out and has a really good first half, and then he's like, yeah, I'm not signing anything. I'm going to free agency. Get it, get it now while and there's the, And then trade him if he does that. But, you know, here's here's the other thing to think about, too. Brian Bannister, what was his big deal as what was his big deal, his reputation with the Giants, right? It was taking cast offs, guys who had developed a flaw, guys who, who couldn't get over a hump to get back to where they needed to be or to reach their potential and turning them into something, right? So he takes Kevin Gaussman, who was a guy in the Braves that they were shuttling between the bullpen and, and the rotation, didn't know what to make of him. He goes to the Giants, Bannister helps turn him into a, a legitimate ace in the league, and it's carried forward now that he's with the, the Blue Jays. So you can't tell me that Bannister doesn't have a hand in looking at Michael Soroka and saying, I think we can unlock this guy, and I, here's what I think we could do. And Ethan Katz even having some thoughts about how they can get Soroka back to where he needs to be. Or Jared Schuster, who is a first-round pick that struggled. And, and again, the Braves are contending this year. They do not have time to figure out to let Jared Schuster figure out how to pitch in the majors. They need a fifth starter who comes in and hits the ground running. The White Sox can give Schuster a whole year to sort it out and can give cats a year to give him a, a chance and banister a year to give him a chance to figure out and all the, all the, you know, all the changes to the pitching within the white Sox organization to try and turn Schuster and Soroka into something. And if you do, and if you are able to lock Soroka up, now you've got two starters taken care of for, for one Aaron bummer that alone is a win because where are you going to find the starting pitching except for on the free agent market or coming from the minors, and Schuster now joins the guys like Jake Eater and you know Nick Nostrini, who are are the sort of next wave that, that you can sit there and say, okay, let's see what we got with these guys. And that includes Kopech, sure. And then, you know, as, as Getz pointed out with Garrett Crochet, they're going to try and progress his innings to see if it's worth stretching him into a starter or just turning him into a super reliever. Yeah, well, and that's also really interesting is how uh, Chris Getz said, uh, basically, yeah, well, he wants to be a starter. We don't know if we're going to get to that point. And he's not depending on it because that's the old way of the White Sox doing things, right? The old way is to say, yeah, we pretty much got what we need. I mean, this guy, this might happen and this guy might have the best year of his life and this guy will never get injured. In fact, nobody's going to get injured and everybody's going to progress. And that's not how Getz is approaching things. And let's talk about Schuster, who you got. So, I mean, you you dealt Bummer, you got Soroka, and again, in my mind, that's good enough for me. And then you go and you add Schuster into the deal, and I see a guy that in 2021, he goes out between two different levels in the minors with a 1.17 whip, and he, he pitches really well. And then he goes out the in the in the next year in 2022 between AA and AAA with a combined 1.048 whip. All right? Here's a guy who keeps guys off base and was effective. And then his first stint in the major leagues stumbled a little, and they didn't have time to wait for him because they're going for a World Series. Again, a team that's on a different level. But I'm telling you right now, Schuster, who is a first-round draft pick at this point in his career, has just as much of a chance of being a stalwart in your rotation as Michael Kopech. Absolutely. If you look at their numbers and their career path, you could actually make the argument that Kopech has had far more time in the major leagues and still hasn't been able to figure out his problems, where Schuster is this raw thing that just kind of had a little bit of time and is going to come back for his year 25 season now after his first taste in the majors and going to get a legitimate shot inside of a rotation for the first time in his career. He's not under pressure. No, he's not. And I, I look at both of these pitchers as essentially, here's Soroka, who's a guy Worst case scenario, I think, is one of your five starters for the next couple of years. That's Again, if you can get something done, I'd lock him in. And Schuster's a guy who has just as good of a shot. He's in that pool now with Kopech fighting for a rotation spot. And if it doesn't work out, he can go into your bullpen just as much as Kopech can go into your bullpen because that's what the good teams do. They go and get a bunch of starting pitchers, and the guys that don't work out end up in the bullpen. Instead of spending $45, $50 million on a bullpen when you don't have anything else around it, and then you're just wasting your money, and you go out and you lose 101 games. So, I mean, like, that's what the good teams do. And that's just two guys. Then you get Nicky Lopez, and he he solves your Elvis Andros problem. 
He's going to give you defense up the middle. He's young. He's still got a little bit of potential. He may still have one of his better seasons this year. He may not. He may go out and hit 240, but play good defense. And that's going to be good enough because, as I said, you're building a bridge to Colson Montgomery. Now you're doing it with Nicky Lopez. And you've saved money. So that money from Hendricks and from Anderson is still sitting there if you decide you want to add to your team. And you pick up another guy that's a minor league player that's basically on the cusp, top 15 in the in the Brave system. And then the final guy is the, is the kid that had a couple of starts in rookie ball or A ball or whatever like that from the University of Illinois, whose whip was a .69. And he, he you don't know what he's going to be. And I'm not even going to worry about him. Okay. You don't have to worry about that guy because he's down there, but big fastball, good slider. Okay, so that's that's a that's a building block for a team to turn him into something. It's five guys for a relief pitcher. It's like a trade I would make in a video game. Zemar sitting down here. He's on the broadcast basement on demand radio network. What's up, buddy? How's it going? Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, uh, you, you're a busy guy right now. You got a lot going on. You're, it's super busy. You're in your busy season, and, and you know it, it's off season for the White Sox, and it's uh, it's on season for Butch. And uh, the main thing you do is help businesses, small and big, with their health insurance, right? For sure. And the fourth quarter is usually when the renewals are coming in. They're trying to plan for the new year, and a lot of businesses feel stuck, right? Uh, just stuck with the renewal. They kind of blindly get spreadsheets, uh, comparisons, and they feel like they don't know where to go. And it's the usually the top three uh, expenses on a expense sheet for a business. How does somebody get your help? 708-535-3006. Um, and then we go through uh, an evaluation we call the Elite Benefits Playbook. All right. And it can get started like like right now? Is right that now like something is they can do? perfect, ideal. The, the employees are still going to have health insurance like when this is all said and done? Absolutely. All right. Butch is my guy. If you're either the owner or you're somebody that makes those financial decisions, it's a big cost for anybody that's trying to get it for employees. And yeah, you don't want to ignore that, right? Uh, 100%. Deeper dive on the acquisitions of Chris Getz in his first ever trade. We bring in the Sox nerd, Dave Marin. You know him. He has all the tidbits. He also runs the, the scoreboard at the rate where he puts up all these interesting little nuggets. And he joins us every week here on Sox in the Basement, brought to you by the Village of Lamont. Want to experience a downtown with real history, great eats and drinks, and green spaces filled with adventure. Visit the Village of Lamont, shop, dine, drink, explore, and see everything they have going on this weekend, including a big cycling race through the forge and a big party afterwards. See it all at LamontDowntown.com. How are you, nerd? Fantastic, Chris. How are you? Hey, man, I like the first deal, but tell me a little bit more about these guys. Chris, let's take a respite from my alphabetical review of the 2023 White Sox and take a Sox nerd-style look at Thursday night's deal with the Atlanta Braves. First, the departed Aaron Bummer. He leaves seventh in Sox history among lefties and 20th overall with 289 appearances. We certainly did see a lot of Aaron, didn't we? Bummer's exit now means that Yoan Moncada is the longest tenured member of the Sox roster. He joined the team in 2016. Now, on to the hall from Atlanta, Mike Soroka. The righty pitched a scoreless inning in the 2019 All-Star Game in Cleveland. His catcher that day was none other than... Yasmani Grandal, who was then a member of the Brewers. Next, Nicky Lopez. The only Naperville Central High School graduate to play in the big leagues is a solid number two hitter. His 304 average and 389 on base percentage in 86 games there are his highest at any spot in the order, with the exception of a three at bat stint in the three hole. How about Jared Schuster? The right hander represented the Braves at the 2022 Futures game. And the second-to-last batter he retired in his one-and-one-third inning stint was the White Sox, Oscar Colas. Next, Braden Shoemake. A second baseman and shortstop, his 16 homers at AAA in 2023 would have ranked third among Sox minor league middle infielders behind Jose Rodriguez's 21 and Lenin Sosa's 17. Finally, Ryan Gowans. Should he make it to the big leagues with the Sox, Gowans will be the first University of Illinois product to play for the team since catcher Mark D'Alessandro in 2001 and the first to pitch for the Sox since the Pope, Don Paul, in 1993. 
Before I get to my zinger, I remind you, you can find more of my stuff on my blog, which you can link to at SocksInTheBasement.com. My zinger, the 2023 White Sox lost 101 games, but still had a player receive votes in the MVP balloting as Luis Robert Jr. took 12th in the recently released results. For the Sox, this is not unusual. The Sox have lost 100 games on five occasions. The only time a Sox 100-loss team did not have a player receive votes in the MVP race was in 2018. The 1932 Sox, who lost 102 times, had two players, Ted Lyons and Billy Sullivan Jr., appear in the MVP voting. That's it, Chris. Probably more than you wanted to know about brave performances in the All-Star and Future Games and the MVP ballot box. And, and, and here's the thing. You, you kind of glossed over Braden Shoemake, okay? And and here's a guy that, you know, you're talking about trying to f- trying to, to, to build a bridge to Colson Montgomery. Shoemake is a guy that has a, still has a chance, uh, you know, a, entering his age 26 season. Like you said, he's been in Gwinnett. He's been in AAA. Uh, he's not been a stellar hitter down in the minors, but serviceable anyway. And you're talking about a guy who could be somebody that, that at least pushes – some other guys to take over that second base spot. You could have actually traded Aaron Bummer. Think about it. If this works out, at least for 2023, you could have traded Aaron Bummer and gotten two fifths of your starting rotation and your entire starting middle infield. I, I know. I don't see this as Chris Getz is done. I see this as Chris Getz no. pulled the trigger and was able to grab some depth because he needed it. Nobody's assured of anything. Jared Schuster's not really assured of a rotation spot. He's going to keep going after pitching. Uh, the, the, the idea that Nicky Lopez is going to be your starting uh, shortstop, he might be your starting second baseman, he might be a utility guy. I, I don't know if this is done yet because I think Chris gets his comments on Friday about the idea that, one, he's not, this is just the beginning and this is building a base, but two, that he's not only looking at what's going to happen this year, like that bridge building, right? But he's looking for guys that are long-term pieces to his team, And so he is doing what we said you got to do. Start building for 25 here in the 24 offseason. And start finding major league ready baseball players, right? We're not making that trade for three guys that are in double A and a single A player. We didn't make a trade like that. We made a trade for guys that can come in and play this year. And a couple of them that have shown an incredible amount of promise in Soroka, of course. Again, his ceiling is very high. I don't know if he'll get back to that. But just getting that promise for Aaron Bummer, what the heck? I'll, I'll take it. And I think the next guy that goes is Aloy because there's already a lot of chatter about the fact that teams are asking about him. And the way that gets his answer in the question about he's such a good player, it's really just been keeping him on the field, but he's going to be a really good player, echoes the comments that he made at the GM meetings where he said, I got a lot of really good players that are, would be great for other teams, not just this one. And I, I, I remember that comment, and I see the comments on Jimenez and the way he's describing him, and I think that's his way of continuously pointing out to other teams, hey, look, people are interested in this guy. Get your offer in now because somebody's going to give me something, and you're going to miss out on him. That's how I read the comments on Friday. Well, and, and here's the other thing about that, too. is it, Again, think about what Aaron Bummer is and what he has been. And the, the big justification for the Braves was that Bummer's FIP, his fielding, his fielder independent pitching was much better than his ERA showed. But his ERA last year was over six. Okay, Aaron Bummer was not effective last year at all. And he is under some fairly team friendly control and whatnot. So there, there's some value to Aaron Bummer. I'm not saying that there isn't. But this is a left handed reliever that has very limited value to another team. Now you're talking about trading away Aloy Jimenez, who, again, with the caveat as always with Aloy, if healthy, is a lineup piece that would fit into pretty much any lineup, including the White Sox, would fit into any lineup that you want to stick him in as a designated hitter, not necessarily as an outfielder. But if you're Chris Getz and you're able to get, again, what could be, and I'm not saying it is, but what could be guys that uh, that that can be your starting shortstop, second baseman, and two of your starting rotation members for Aaron Bummer, plus a prospect for Aaron Bummer, Imagine what Aloy Jimenez, who does have a lot of value to other teams and would have a lot of value to other teams, or dare to dream what happens if he does get an offer for Dylan Cease that he's willing to take. If this is the level that Getz is starting off at with with a trade, where he's sitting here saying, I can identify pieces, 
I can be smart enough to identify from the Braves what are useful pieces that they have that they don't need or want and leverage that with the player that they that I have that they want, okay? So if he, there's a taker for Aloy Jimenez, you can see where Chris Getz is not going to do the Rick Hahn thing of sit there and go, I, I'm only looking at the top five prospects on your thing, and I just want to take your best prospect. No. He's looking at it going... Soroka's got a high ceiling. He could come back. Maybe we got a chance to lock this guy down. Schuster's another first-round arm, another left-handed starter for our system that we can turn something into. Lopez is a professional baseball player. Braden Shoemake is a guy with some potential still that could that could still make the majors and 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 have some sort of an impact as a major league baseball player. And then we a prospect. And then a prospect. And then a prospect. So so it, it, it's not that's where you get excited because he traded one of the guys that honestly had the most limited value I think on the trade market in a left-handed reliever and he's talking about trading a legitimate DH he's talking about taking offers on uh you know a guy who two years ago was a Cy Young candidate he's he's looking at anybody and everyone and and I would be excited to see what happens when he does go and trade some of these guys because you can bet Gavin Sheets is not going to be on this team no. because the the premium on defense is way too high for Gavin Sheets. Gavin Sheets doesn't fit what the what the general manager has described as what he wants on his team. As much as Oscar Colas can leave his winter ball and go work out, which gets talked about, like he had two paths, he decided to pick the other one, uh, but he's not part of the plan, I don't think, in right field. And guess what? Getz didn't just throw away money. I don't want to see that with, oh, he got rid of Bummer because he's trying to shave salary because we're going into a rebuild. Nicky Lopez and Mike Soroka's salaries from last year, and they're going to get bumps in arbitration, you would imagine. Just their salaries last year compared to what Bummer was scheduled to make this year, which was $5.5 million, they're already a million over just those two players out of the five that he acquired, and they're going to get bumps. So this is not a salary shave. This is a change what's on my team move and again lay a base and it 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 makes so much sense to me I know it's not going to make sense to everybody because let's be honest over the last couple years you've been fed that if you make a trade you're supposed to get somebody's best prospect on a list and if you make a trade and and if you trade anybody away who's good for other players you must be going into a long-term rebuild I don't see it yet and trust me I'm watching for it because I'm worried about it happening But right now what I see is smart baseball moves being made with the idea that you're not going to compete in 2024, but you can damn sure change the way the team is run and the culture of the team and what you're known for and improve your defense and start to find pitchers and long-term solutions. Like why even acquire Soroka if you're not thinking that you're going to try to lock this guy in for a couple years? You don't don't need a one-year pitcher, right? So I don't think that's what the plan is here. And that's what I really enjoy about the moves that, that the move that was made. I, you know, and so far so good. That's how I see. It. I don't. I don't think you could say we lost on trading away a relief pitcher for five players, two of which have in, have a chance to be in your rotation legitimately next year, and a guy that's up the middle, good that's defensive, and then a couple of other players that have that have high potential. I, I, I for a relief pitcher, great trade. I love it. Now go out and do it again. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always on SocksInTheBasement.com.